Welcome to the Daily Update. This is being prepared Monday, September 19th, where we'll look at the action in the market today and then see how things look for Tuesday, September 20th. Not a big changing day, but there are some things happening under the surface that are looking kind of positive. So I want to point those things out. We had a slight update. So some of our charts are showing some improvement. We've almost gotten back to 3,900. That could be positive. But until we close above that, we have to treat that as resistance for right now. We have a lot of things coming out this week, specifically the FOMC decision, which will come Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern, followed by the press conference and the market will really react to that since that's what everybody is fixated on right now so let's go back and talk about what happened right at the open we had a gap lower not really surprising we were down quite a bit more during the night europe kind of had a difficult session and that took the s p futures down with it well as we got a little bit closer to the open they showed some improvement the economic report that came out really it didn't have all that impact much of an impact on the market at all but we gapped lower and we went down to s1 at 38.47 and that was right at friday's low that could be seen as positive number one to go back to the previous session's low and then bounce up off of that that's what happened and when we get to the chart i'll show you that then as we went up from there Prices rose to almost R1, not quite up to that level at 38.90. We were below that, but we did see some recovery after the open. Prices then drifted above and below the unchanged level. And that's pretty much what the day was like. You have a lot of indecisiveness right now. People don't really know what to do. You've got major things happening later in the week. So why would you want to assume some kind of a position, either long or short, ahead of that? knowing that you can get whipsawed very easily. I have to clear my throat. <clears throat> Please forgive me for that. It seems to never happen until I start recording. Well, as the day went on, we saw some late day buying. And this is another thing that could potentially be positive. It took prices back to R1. Not that we got to R1, but we're starting to see a pattern in both Friday session and in Monday session. We closed at the high. That's usually a good sign as well. We were up 0.69%. There's a lot of damage that needs to be repaired. There was a bit of, an, bit of an oversold condition that we're dealing with. So the fact that we saw some bouncing here. The other idea is that the Monday after options expiration can often be quite negative. We didn't see that. There wasn't really a lot of market action going on. Volume has now dropped back below average. That kind of makes sense. Again, ahead of a big week, ahead of things changing. So people are just kind of stepping back and just saying, okay, I, I'm going to make some decisions, but not necessarily in Monday's session. The technicals, they're still negative overall. We've got a lot of damage that's been done, and it's still just not looking very good. But we don't ever want to just hang our hat on that. When the market is going down, I have a tendency to look for positive things. When the market's going up, I have a tendency to look for negative things. And it's just the way that I found works for me when I analyze what's going on. But we're negative overall. But there are some positive, potentially small little positive things that we can latch on to. Of course, inflation and interest rates, which is producing growth concerns, that's the real focus right now. And the debate, I'm not hearing as much about that. There, People just are like, okay, we're in a bad situation right now, whether it's a recession or not. Let's forget about that. Let's just try to get through this whole thing. And then we'll have an awful lot of Fed speak coming out, especially on Wednesday. So what are some comments? The last two sessions have seen early weakness where we gapped lower with late day buying. And that's one of the positive things that I'm getting from this where it's the futures market that really takes things lower during the night. There's a gap lower. And then we don't see a lot of action during the day in the daily session, like on Friday as well as on Monday, because most of the move happens right at the open. But what we're seeing is late day buying. And that's oftentimes, that's the smart money coming in. Because remember the old adage, 
It's the amateurs who open the market. It's the professionals who close the market. So if we really focus on things, and this is what I do when I'm doing trend-based strategies, I don't really worry about the open. I don't really pay attention to much of anything. I think it's interesting to watch, but when I really start to take notice is the last one to two hours. And that's when I really hone in on, okay, what's going on here? Are we looking better? Are we looking worse? Well, we're seeing that because that's what the professionals do. And we want to be doing what they're doing since they tend to be right, where most of the other crowd tends to be wrong. The S&P has almost regained 3,900. We're just about at that level, just a few ticks below it. Again, we should treat that as resistance for right now. The technical picture, it's tentatively improving. Now, we have a down session. It's going to wipe this stuff right off the table. But as of Monday, we're seeing some potentially promising improvements right now. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. We still have three of the yield curves that I measure. It's not all the yield curves out there, but it's the ones that I look at. The 30 to the 5, the 10 to the 2, and the 10 to the 5, they still remain inverted. Sentiment is still tipping over more towards the greed side of things. We had the NAHB housing market index. It came in at 46. That was below 50. So that's showing a lack of confidence in the real estate market or the housing market. They expected it to come in at 48. So this was actually weaker than expected. And that's kind of the trend that we've been seeing with some of the real estate based economic statistics is there's really showing some weakness with mortgage applications coming down, with the market index coming down. We're going to get a lot more real estate data as the week goes on to give us a better picture of what's actually happening in the housing market or real estate. The trend is still negative and we're below 20. Even with the slight update, the ADX has not crossed back above 20. It's close, but it really hasn't moved back up yet. I've switched our bias now from mixed to negative with a pretty big slant on negative, but mixed because we had an up day and we're seeing what could be some positive things. But if we don't see follow through price action, it's going to wipe those positive things right out. Our momentum I'm still keeping is negative because we're in a, a pretty down negative environment right now. So as of Monday's close, they're still saying there's an 82% chance that at Wednesday's FOMC meeting, that rates are going to be raised three quarters of a percent or 75 basis points to three to three and a quarter. We're just about at the same reading that we were after Friday's session. There's still <clears throat> about 18% of the folks are saying, well, there might be a 1% increase in the Fed funds rate. That hasn't really grown all that much. So we're kind of going with what the market had originally anticipated at being uh, three quarters of a percent. They had been going from half a percent to three quarters. Well, after CPI last week, that got taken off. And now they're looking at one percent. But still, the probability seems rather low. So our sentiment, we're still tilting over to the fear side and not really giving an extreme reading currently. And here's another sentiment gauge, which combines a lot of different things. It's also pretty much in the same area that we're looking at. It's tilting over more towards the extreme fear side, but not going into extreme fear territory. Pretty much what we're seeing in our other index. The right X bear bull ratio actually spiked up a little bit. People are getting a little fearful, not giving us a necessarily extreme reading, but it is higher than it has been. And there have been times when this has spiked at this level, but it could have more room to go to the spiking level if we see more declines in the market. Here's another thing that small caps, um, looking forward, their forward PE, it's well below the long-term average. And that's another area that's been dragging down the market lately, especially since the CPI came out is that the small caps are really underperforming. Well, on a forward PE basis, they're actually inexpensive. The average should be around this light blue line. We're well below that. So at some point, folks that really like to find these small caps and get into them, hoping to find the, the next latest and greatest stock at a lower price, that could give the market some support. Well, it's not really happening right now. So that's still something that could play into the scenario in the future. 
This is just showing the average stock percent decline from the 52 week high. Here we're going down to two standard deviations where we have the median here right in the middle. And yeah, we, we went down below that, but now we're coming back up. Are we getting ready to come back down? So again, just kind of an interesting chart to look at. It's not really giving us all that much insight right now. Here's another one, the S&P 500, where the, it's at currently, and the EPS. Here's another Goldman Sachs chart. They're still suggesting, after they've adjusted things, that earnings are going to go higher. They're going to be, in 2022, the estimate is for 226, and then in 223, 234. That's higher than the 209 where we have been at right now. Well, the market isn't really seeing things that way. We're down at around 3,900, and they think that by the end of the year, the market is anticipating that it'll be back to about 4,300. And a lot of times, when we have midterms, it, September can be a very difficult month for the market, but then a lot of times after the midterms are over, there's some optimism out there, and we might see stocks bounce after that. We don't know if that's going to happen, but that has what historically has happened in the past, so we want to be aware of that. Here's another one just showing a more hawkish Fed tightening path. It just shows that they're not going to be letting up. This whole scenario that inflation is top and it's coming down, although it may be true and it might be actually happening, it hasn't convinced the Fed to pivot. They're still much more hawkish right now. They're not turning more dovish. So these are the estimates going forward of what they see. And this will change all the time as different things are happening. Then short interest, this still continues to be quite low. When I show you this chart, I like to point out that we like a lot of short interest, maybe four or five, six percent, because those are built in buyers. Those are people that have to sell to get into the market, which can drive prices lower. But if these folks are starting to lose because the S&P is going up, they have to buy to get back in. And that can often produce a short cover rally because they have to close out their positions. There's a lot more requirements and you have to babysit things a lot heavier if you actually short the market. Now we use other tools in the program that I teach where we have different types of ETFs and even mutual funds that are inverted where if the S&P goes down, the value of that ETF goes up. But th this is actual shorting itself and it's pretty low right now. So that just means that on one hand, you can look at this and say not a lot of people are shorting the market right now, or you could you could take that as kind of positive, but at the same time, it can be negative because now there's not those built-in buyers, or there's a lot more risk when you short the market this way, and maybe a lot of these folks are using some of the other instruments that don't have the financial requirements of actually going short. Anyway, all right, then this is looking at another Goldman Sachs Bloomberg study here. It says, we have revised down our GDP forecast. Well, that's pretty much what everybody's doing. And now expect zero G GDP for 2022 and 1.1% 1 .1 in 2023. So it, they're jumping on the bandwagon and we're seeing this internationally as well, where we're the, a lot of companies are really revising their GDP growth down. They're not negative on this chart, but they are forecasting zero growth. So that kind of keeps us right on the edge of being in a recession or not, according to that definition. Here's another one. This is the nominal Fed fund rate of always exceeded inflation by late cycle. Well, this isn't really telling us anything. We this What they're saying in the title, yeah, that's interesting. And But we still have a ways to go with this Fed funds rate. And we're getting ready for this line to even go higher. So this really doesn't apply to our situation right now. And another measure of inflation that we want to keep an eye on, which will be coming out later, is the core PCE inflation. We have CPI and then we have PCE. We look at both of those. All right. Then here's what they're asking people. What do you expect of the U.S. economy over the next 12 months? And 37.7%. <clears throat> They're expecting an inflation and a recession where 
28.1% are saying, yeah, we're going to have inflation, but just slower growth. We're not really going to go into a recession. 20.2% say we're going to get disinflation or deflation with a recession and then disinflation with no, okay. Yeah, sure. Whatever. We follow the charts. We look at what's actually happening, but you're having folks really try to pick out a, a, a stance for themselves of what do they think is going to happen from here? I personally try to stay away from these types of conclusions, keeping all of these conclusions open at the same time, instead of saying, this is what I've concluded right now, and I'm just gonna stick with that. Well, what if you're wrong? I mean, you always have to be able to adjust. So my personal take is look at all of these things as potential things that could happen into the future. All right, then we have another sentiment indicator, which is not giving us an extreme negative reading. This is just another way to measure things. When we drop down below this one minus one standard deviation, we're fearful, but when we really get fearful is when we drop below the minus 1.5 standard deviation. And this kind of lines up with the other sentiment gauges that we're looking at. All right, so let's go back and look at Monday's session. We had growth in bouncing back up pretty nicely, especially when you compare it to value. Saw a little bit of an outperformance with the mid caps and actually underperformed with the small caps. That could be a little bit of a concern. We want to see across the board outperformance of growth if those sector rotation scenarios are going to come back and be viable. The VIX really declined and it never really has spiked to this point. With the update, it did decline. That's not surprising, but we've seen this thing even decline on down days. It declined on Friday, so it's not really getting up to an, a real high level currently, which on one hand, you could see it as positive, meaning that people aren't really freaked out yet, which might produce some confidence of going forward. But on the other hand, you can see this as negative, saying we have more room to run to the downside before people really start, start to take the declines seriously. Then we have the VIX of the VIX, which is also treading pretty much sideways right now because the volatility is just not picking up. The ulcer index, it's still a little bit above the moving average. This kind of lines up with the sentiment reading because this tries to measure fear. Then the mass index, we're just keeping an eye on this because it has not generated a signal yet. It won't until it crosses above the blue line. But since we're headed in that direction, I just want to be aware of that ahead of time. We're down 19.07% from the all-time high. We saw a real drop. This was a little surprising to me. That might have had to do with the expiration of options last Friday, and people just haven't gone in and re-upped their puts or re-upped their hedging yet. But we saw a real drop-off in the put-call ratio on the one-day chart. It turn, it's turning down just slightly with the five-day chart. Looking at support and resistance, here are the pivot levels for Tuesday's session. And I'm going to wait and talk about the action here when we get to the other chart. We're looking at this daily chart. First, you can see how volume dropped off. We're below average now. I, I don't know if I'd read too much into that, just other than indecisiveness ahead of what could be a pretty heavy week, where... With the price action of the S&P on the daily chart, we came down almost to this S1 and then bounced back up. And we did not exceed the low from Friday. So that's pretty positive. Here are the pivot points that are good for the whole month of September. I update this every day with the current bar, but I, I don't do a lot of analysis with this. Looking at some FIB levels, where this is a short-term FIB level going from the June low to the August high, and we retrace down below this 32.8%. Well, we're coming right back up there now. And notice how we're at 3899.89. We're right at this level. So the market's at another tipping point, but we have to treat this as resistance until we actually close above that. Then another short-term FIB chart going from the high that was set in August down to what had been a low in September we fell through that, but now we've been able to come back above that level. So that's some positive construction going on with our daily chart. Longer term, we're still above these two overlapping FIB levels at 
which is 38.26. And then there's a 38.2% retracement at 36 point, or 36.29. This is pretty significant because we have overlapping time zones here. One part of this chart goes from the COVID low to the all-time high. The other one goes from a low that we set back in 2021 to the all-time high. And then to see them line up the way they have, this is so far providing good support. If we really break below this, that could be quite negative. All right, then our weekly chart. We're still just above this 38.2% retracement level. And again, if we start to break below that, that's gonna be a lot more negative. This could produce some support for us to go up from here. On Monday, looking at our sectors, um, we had the discretionary, which still has been kind of sneaking along, doing a little bit better. It was up the strongest, followed by materials. And then we had three weak areas, healthcare, energy, and real estate. And then here's our scooter scores, just showing that the utilities and energy charts, they're still looking the best on a technical analysis basis. And we still have communication looking pretty pathetic at 6.3. Then looking at our different sectors, again, this just shows that energy is still performing the best, followed by utilities, with all of the other sectors being negative, going back to the all-time high. This is just an update of the different indexes. Right in the middle here, this is the S&P. That's what we're basing things on. How have these other indexes performed since the S&P hit its all-time high back in January? Technical alerts, some negative, some positive where the NASDAQ dropped below 11.4. Then it got back above that and went above 11.5. We had the S&P go slightly above 3,900, but closed right below that. We're still seeing some weakness. Communication setting a two-year low. Utilities. This is something we want to watch out for, for one of the ratios that we study with the utilities against the S&P. We want the S&P to outperform the utilities, and we're starting to see some weakness but this is what we call an overbought signal. It's just dropped below 80. It'll turn more negative if it drops below 50, and it'll turn really negative if it drops below 20. So it, we're just seeing some kind of shorter term weakness right now. The Euro crossed below 100. Um, oil got back above 85. So we're seeing some bouncing around here. The mid caps are still looking the best, even though they're not looking all that great at 60.5. When we get into the high 80s and into the 90s, that's when these scores are really good. Well, when you're at 60, that's not all that well, but that's still number one compared to the Dow, which is at 52.8. The s and is in third place at 44.5. Small caps are at 36.2 and taking up the rear or the Qs, which is the NASDAQ 100 at 17.6. All right, let's go back and talk about this action. I'm going to go back to Friday where we gapped lower and then we pretty much chopped sideways for the rest of the day. Most of the movement came overnight with the futures contracts that were trading. But see how we bumped up going into the close. Hmm, this is the smart money buying. Well, we had a similar situation on Monday. We gapped lower and then just treaded above and below the unchanged level. And then we saw some buying coming back in right into the close. We've seen that happen two days now. So it could be positive. It could be some of the smart money lining up, starting to buy while everything is looking really bad. So we just want to watch this and see how things go moving forward. As far as our trend, we're still barely below 20 with the ADX. We're at 19.97. And the ADX and the moving average are pretty much on top of each other. We need to default to negative because the red line, even though it's declining, is still on top with the green line turning up a little bit, but it is on the bottom. The Arun, no change from Monday's session, just showing that buyer, excuse me, sellers are in control, even though that ticked down slightly, and buyers are really starting to trail off as well. We compare the two with each other. That's the oscillator down below. You might make a case that we're starting to get extreme negative with this oscillator, but it could still drop a little lower from where it's at right now. We saw a bit of an in, of improvement with the advanced decline line. It ticked up slightly based on price and just a little bit based on volume, but we're still below a declining moving average with the volume. 
The advanced decline ratio is coming right back up to about the zero line, even though it's still below. So that's an improvement, but still negative. New highs, new lows are kind of flattening out with our five period. We saw a real expansion on Friday. Well, that continued not as much on Monday, but we're seeing the new lows really start to outpace new highs. And with our 10 day, we're still headed lower with the moving average. So this is under the hood. We're not seeing a lot of strength really coming back into the market yet. And if you recall, when we were bouncing up slightly and things were looking a lot better, the new highs, new lows were continuing to go lower during that time. And I tried to point that out at the time. This is another positive thing. See how accumulation distribution has gone above the moving average and actually advanced. So that's more positive there. Short term, we're still looking extreme with our rate of change going back five periods. And then we, this is more positive. We were able to get back above this anchored moving average, which goes to the COVID low. We fell below that on Friday. Well, in Monday session, we've closed just a little above that. Stoke RSI showing a little bit of an improvement and the Williams percent R after giving an extreme negative rating is showing some improvement. The force index was up slightly, even though it's still negative overall. However, the Swinland trading oscillator continues to decline based on price and volume. Our McClellan oscillator still below zero, but showing improvement. So these are some of the positive things that I'm seeing here. The 20 period moving average after going extreme is now bouncing up. 50 turned up and 200 turned up a little bit here. Stochastic, trying to show some improvement in the short term, rolling over positive in the intermediate term. Long term still has yet to get out of its decline. Looking at some intermediate charts, we're just coming back up from an extreme reading with the rate of change going back 20 periods. The Sean trend meter was pretty much flat. And our PMO, can, this is an oscillator and it continues to head lower. It is not crossed based on price or volume where the PMOs that are rising, showing a little bit of an improvement, still declining with the buy signals and still declining with the percent of PMOs that are above zero. Take an oscillator, this is something else. It turned up a little bit on Friday. Well, it's continuing to show a little bit more of improvement after Monday's session. The Jake and money flow also showing some improvement. Volume really dropped off because we had options expiration last Friday and we were below average volume on Monday. So that's why you're seeing this go down. The vortex, it's still negative, but the red line is coming down as the green line is going up. Just want to make sure I didn't miss a chart. Our summation index based on price is still negative, but look at the, it's really hard to see folks. This is turning up ever so slightly. And a lot of times volume will tend to lead price. Now, it doesn't mean that this is automatic, that this is going to happen, but this is another little positive thing that we're seeing develop currently. Still have the slope. It thinks everything's hunky-dory. I'm not sure what, what's going on there with all of our other oscillators still pointed down. The BPI remains below 50 and continues to decline. That's more negative. The ease of movement is going back up, even though it's below zero, it is advancing slightly. The ultimate oscillator also turned up a little bit, but still below zero. Money flow index also turning back up. And the chicken, or excuse me, I don't know why I say chicken here. It's the commodity channel index or CCI coming out of giving us an extreme negative reading with the 14 period and just turning up ever so slightly with the 20 period. TTM squeeze, this is just thinking that nothing bad really ever happened. When you see these faded red bars continue to go up, it thinks that it's party time and the market's just going higher. So this has not been a really valid signal based on what we've been seeing in real life. But with the balance of power, see how it crossed above the dash line? This is usually the dividing line. Above the dash line is positive, below is negative. We're crossing slightly back above. This is another potentially positive thing where the first signal is generated, and this was a sell signal when it came down through this green line, it was almost ready to go through the red line, but see how it's turning back up. So this hasn't turned negative yet. If it can turn and go back above the green line, that would be another positive signal. Now, if we continue to fall, this will probably fall back below the red line and then it will be a negative signal. 
Different charts. Our high can ashy is still negative with the black bars. Kiggy continues to be negative with the red. Renko continues to be negative with the red box. Three line break is still negative. Nothing really new on the point and figure chart. We're waiting to see can we maintain this upward slant or trend line. If we really start to drop below that, that could be quite negative. We're switching back to neutral with the S&P and the elder system. It's blue now, as it is for the SPY. The SAR continues to be negative with the dots on top. The go no go system is still in a deep purple state, so that's negative. Some longer term charts, seeing a little bit of an improvement with the 50, 150, and 200. Special K still predicting the end of the world. And the diamonds are switched back to neutral. And here's the Dow. It came down to S1 and then bounced up off of that. That so far could be positive price movement. And then here's the Qs where they've switched back to neutral with the elder impulse system. It also came down, broke a little bit below S1, but also is bouncing up off of that support level. And then the Vixen continues to decline. It isn't really spiking up all that high. <clears throat> this is to the NASDAQ 100, what the VIX is to the S&P 500. The NASDAQ also was able to hit support and bounce up off of that. The mid caps also hit support and are bouncing. See, so these are some potentially positive things. The Wilshire didn't quite get down to S1, but is also showing some improvement, but it did not exceed Friday's high. The dollar, it was up almost a quarter of a percent. It still just continues to go up and up. Where the S&P to the dollar, they're still having a pretty strong inverse relationship. I think they were both up in Friday's session. So that's why you're seeing this tick up a bit. But they're usually having a tendency to go in opposite directions of each other. Gold was up a little bit, but it's still in an overall downtrend, as is silver. It was actually unchanged in Monday's session. Oil bounced up a little bit to 85.36. The correlation between the S&P and oil still in neutral territory. And looking at bonds, this is just not helping the market out. We're starting to see continued weakness with the total bond ETF. We're still breaking below the COVID lows in the world bond index. The stock to bond correlation, they're still having a tendency to go more in the same direction, whether that's up or down. And then our yield curves still show the 10 to the 5 is inverted. The 10 to the 2 is inverted. The 30 to the 5 is inverted. And we're keeping an eye on the 10 to the 3 months. It still has not gone inverted yet. Then the tech sector, the 10-year yield, they're having a tendency to go in opposite directions. As interest rates continue to go up, that is really putting a lot of pressure on stocks. Our scenarios, just updates here. We're still seeing a, the copic curve crossing over and giving a signal. Again, this does not tell us what the direction will be. It's just suggesting that something big might happen. And with the Fed, with the market's kind of settling at certain levels. Maybe the market's getting ready to do something. We just don't know if that's going to be up or down at this point. So we have to use other charts to make those decisions. Here's this the updated of one of the possible possible positive scenarios where we look at the stocks above their 200 day simple moving average, showing a little bit of an improvement here. And then this is the 50 period study with the S&P, the mid caps, and the small caps. And I, I did that out of order. There's the small caps. And then looking at the highs minus lows over a 10 day period, also showing just a little bit of an improvement, but not anything to really get excited about yet. Looking at a broad base study, it's still showing that the highs minus the lows are negative because we're below zero and not giving us an extreme reading yet, which would often generate a new signal. The equity put call ratio, it's still, it's coming off of where it had been, but not really telling us much right now. The small cap index actually came back up through S1, even though it's been really underperforming. And it actually spiked up just a little bit compared to the S&P, but it's, it's still just not looking all that healthy right now. This chart is just not giving us any insight. 
we're seeing kind of a negative correlation between the S&P and the 10-year yield on this chart. And then here's our sector rotation where the Qs are underperforming discretionary is just kind of secretly going higher and higher. But the large cap growth against the large cap value, even though it improved slightly, is still under the moving average. And then we're still seeing pretty much across the board weakness with the other sector rotation charts that we look at. We're still seeing a pretty solid inverse correlation between the S&P and the two-year yield. And that is creating a new spike. As the two-year yield continues to go up in comparison to the S&P, and just in and of itself, it's taking out the spike that we had been looking at. We just don't know when that spike will actually stop. And then here's looking at the S&P against the utilities ticked up ever so slightly, but still the utilities are outperforming the S&P. That's why you're seeing this line really decline. We want to see this turn and go back up. And then quite often that can mark a bottom in the market, but we're just not seeing that yet. Staples pretty much unchanged. So we're still looking at this spike that happened a while back now, even though this is coming back up, as long as we stay below this spike, this could give some support to S&P 500 prices. So what's our outlook for Tuesday? We're still negative, but showing some improvement. And I tried to point those things out. We have housing starts and building permits. Now these tend to be leading indicators they'll, they'll, because you have to do these things before you actually start building. The whole list of geopolitical events with inflation and interest rates really being the focus for the stock market right now. Our scenarios, we kind of still have to lean towards the downside because most everything is negative because of all the headwinds that I keep talking about every day. Our technicals are negative, but you may not want to really go with the down scenario because we're seeing some positive blips of light. So as close to the end of the day and what is the direction of the market? That's what I will be looking at. We certainly can't go with the up scenario right now because we're negative overall, even though there is some improvement. Our scenarios, eh, not really helping us right now. The technicals, we still have to get back to some moving averages, but we've been able to hold support at least after Monday's session. We'll have to see if that can continue. So we're kind of going with the sideways trend, even though the ADX is just barely below 20. It is below 20, and the moving average and the ADX are right on top of each other. So that would be another reason to maybe, at least for Tuesday's session, to consider the market to be neutral. If we see a big move one way or the other, then you might adapt to possibly the down scenario. I, and it's going to take a lot to get back to the up scenario right now. So our conclusion, S&P, it's negative overall. And I pretty much have the same thing here for the short and intermediate term. We're negative, but showing some improvement. Long term, we're still negative. So thank you. Have a wonderful Tuesday. I'll just watch things. If there are big changes in the charts, I will do a video for Wednesday session. If there's not, if we just kind of bump along sideways and nothing really happens and there's not a lot of changes going on, I may just do a daily brief for Wednesday session. So that's to be determined at this point.